Hey, what's up, college baseball fans? <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the 11.7 podcast, where we're here to recap weekend number six of the uh, college baseball season. We will preview the midweek at the very end, um, but we have a ton of storylines. We got a lot of a lot of just crazy action. Um, I went on a little work trip that turned into a college baseball tour up in North Carolina. Uh, Jack joined along. Jack got to call a game, too. And, and as Dimitri shows his Modelo light, um, drinking on the job tonight. But anyways, it was a fun weekend. We got some great stories to tell. We got some great interviews this past weekend. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just keep you guys all up to date there. There was some huge series like South Carolina, Vanderbilt, Clemson, Florida State, LSU, Florida. It, like the list goes on and on. And uh, we'll break down those series too. And uh, of course, we always start the episode off with our home field apparel team of the week. And let me share my screen now. If you guys are watching on YouTube, um, we're going to show you home field apparel's website and the team of the week, the fighting Gamecocks of South Carolina. Hand up. I came out with a bold statement a week ago from today, a very bold statement and said, South Carolina was the second worst team in the sec. They, God had, no fight. Damn, that they had no passion. Uh, when they played against Ole Miss last week. And sure enough, they crapped all over my head and <laughs> swept the team that I said was probably a top two or three team, in the country, <laughs> maybe even number one, playing the best baseball. They swept the Vanderbilt Commodores right in my face. Uh, it was so bad that Jack and I avoided driving through Columbia, South Carolina on our way home. Uh, we took the back roads of North Carolina down we, i don't know down the coast should we but, really why though we, it was a long weekend we wanted to avoid the parade traffic for the party they were going to throw me for standing up for him last week when i said they were going to be a-okay and then ethan petri needed a big time founders part moment like he delivered against paul Skeens last year but the part the parade columbia i'm so sorry founders i will be back right um yeah, hand up. I was dead wrong. Like, I, this is probably the most embarrassed I've been in a long time on this show. And I embarrass myself a good bit. But at the end of the day, it's all about laughing at yourself. Uh, don't take yourself too seriously. And with the cherry on top, go buy yourself a South Carolina Gamecocks home field apparel shirt using our promo code CWS24, um, homefieldapparel.com. 15% off your first purchase there. And I don't know what it is about this shirt right here, the South Carolina Williams Bryce Stadium tee. This is fire. Like, this is amazing. They got tons of different options. Bomber jackets always hit. Wait, um, we've got wait, some, back up. Some good feedback from a lot of people that uh, have used the promo code and, and love the quality of the uh, of the merch. They do it the best over there at Home Field Apparel. So, y'all go check them out there. Why and, do you think? Uh, why do you think Carolina feeling peachy? Did they win the Peach Bowl in 1969 or something? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, if I knew that, you guys should be worried. If I knew that South Carolina won the Peach Bowl in 1969, y'all should be worried about me. Uh, because that means I'm not being a good dad. That means I'm not uh, being a good college baseball analyst. Uh, I got a lot wrong with me if I knew that. So, um, But, boys, let's just kick off right. Let's just talk about this Vanderbilt-South Carolina series real quick. I, I know there's a lot of people that are wanting this, us to talk about the mid-major – Power rankings that we just released. I know there's a lot of people that want to talk about Florida run rule and LSU today and winning the series uh, and how Jack Caglione is like the best all around college baseball player I've seen. And I think a lot of people have seen in 20 years, uh, maybe, maybe close to all time. Uh, and then you got like Charlie Condon knocking on the door with like 17 homers already this year, three homer day. Uh, it, it's just kind of crazy right now that we're, it's only March 24th and you can start feeling the storylines building up, not only in the SEC, but the ACC as well. The Big 12 is a jumble. Like, it's just jumbled up. Uh, there's just so many – there's so much parody in college baseball. Teams will sweep one week, get swept the next. Um, Unbelievable, dude. Bipolar as fuck. The college baseball is so bipolar right now. Talk about Troy. Talk about South Alabama. Talk about Vanderbilt. Talk about Florida State. Talk about, like, South Carolina. Talk about, I mean, Alabama. All these teams are showing up one weekend and sleepwalking the next weekend. Yep. But that's why the sport's so great. It's so unpredictable. 
unlike this college basketball tournament that I've been watching, uh, where the it, it's the chalkiest March Madness tournament I've ever seen. I think there was one upset in the round of 64, and that was Clemson beating Baylor. Uh, it, this is this tournament's turning into like a snooze fest. No exciting moments. Very few exciting moments. But I can guarantee you this: when when college baseball regionals roll around, there's going to be upsets. It, it's not going to be chalk. You're going to see an Oral Roberts make it to the uh, a team like that making it to the College World Series. It, it's just a completely different tournament. Way more exciting. Um, College basketball sucks. I think I'm going to say it right now. I don't care about college basketball, so sure, I agree. I'm going to say it right now. Two four seeds make make super regionals this year. Saying it right now, not one, but two. So you're going to one up my call from last year, where I said a four seed was going to make Omaha. Two four seeds are making the super regional. I I've seen enough. I've seen enough. Well, I think I love there's this, there's this question too, where like there are teams like a Florida, for example, who looks like absolutely nails in run ruling the reigning national champions say, but like refuse to win midweek games. Is that the power to, is that, that the power in parity? Or is that like a team that just can't figure it out? I know we talked about that a ton last week. But right. I want to look like like even like the Sun Belt or even Dude, the Big East has gotten off to a crazy hot start. Like, I just think we're seeing the best product of college baseball that maybe the sport can use. I agree. But wait, weren't we just talking about Vanderbilt, South Carolina series? Now we're talking about yeah. running back on us. No, it was my fault. I think I ran it off of Ben and then you ran it off me. We got it. We got to circle back. I'll we'll circle back here. Look, the, 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 the sweep at home. Has got to feel great for South Carolina and South Carolina fans, right? And they, instead of being, you know, they, they go one and two in, in Oxford last week and look dead. I, I pronounced them dead. I thought that they were going to be just not a good team in the SEC. They go and sweep at home. And like the sweep was so convincing that it has me like, this is an overreaction possibly, but it has me thinking like South Carolina, like they could win the SEC. Uh, like, that's how much it switched bipolar. And <laughs> look what I'm telling you. Think about it. Like, if you can take a team as hot as Van Wilt's been at home and beat them so bad that like there was no close games, like it, it felt like uh Founders Park was rocking, like they were smashing balls. Now it's like, is is South Carolina gonna win this? Not win that, maybe that compete for an SEC title, or are they gonna be like a back and forth team all year? I'll I'll tell you why they can. Because Eli Jones has turned into a premier Friday night guy. He was filthy game one yesterday. Um, he like you have to you have to have the guy in the SEC that can deliver when the lights are on on like a Thursday or Friday night. And he's turned into that. And like I said last week, not to toot my own horn, but Cole Messina and Ethan Petra are gonna be themselves. Like they were gonna wake up and they did, and they did it in a massive way. But the supporting cast and like what they're throwing out on Sundays is what has surprised me a ton, and that's why I, I think to your point, they absolutely can go in the SEC. Yeah, I, I think they're a real team. I, I take back everything I said. Uh, I think they're a real team. They showed a lot of fight. They showed a lot of passion. I hope my spiel from March seventeenth, that YouTube clip. I hope it's the clip that they showed the team, and like that's going to be the first clip of their uh, their Omaha championship parade. Like they're gonna show that and be like, you know what? Ben Upton fired us up. He was dead right. We were playing dead. Now that's not gonna happen, but you know what? I can dream you know a little bit. So funny about all of this, in my opinion, besides the play on the field, you said they suck, they didn't, whatever. That's that's whatever. That's sports. You talk about sports, you look stupid one weekend, you look smart the next. We all do it. But one of my favorite clips I've ever clipped is Gary Ganey. Um Post save celebration. That guy literally said, "Fuck you, Ben Upton. You want to see some energy? You want to see some fight? <laughs> yeah. I'll show you some of that." Ba 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 ba. Yeah, Garrett Ganey. Shout out to his brother. We've been ta in talks with him for close to two weeks now about getting his bro a little pencil talk guy. And then he goes out. And by the way, like this was that wasn't a one time deal, right? Like he's been doing this all year. Like he's the kind of guy, like that back end bully with like pardon my French, like a fuck you fastball. He's like, I, I'm, he's like that in a down 10 game and an up 10 game. Um, so, but he's like contagious, right? Like even Messina's hitting a double celly. And like, people, that are, 
for the people that are wondering what we're talking about on the YouTube. X <laughs> down the door, automatic machine gun. Sick. He's awesome. Yeah, we're showing it right now on the YouTube. So uh, if you guys haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube. Uh, watch our episodes. Like we're, we show our face. Um, show some cool video clips during the YouTube as well. But I know our bread and butter's podcast. This is going to come out in podcast form. Uh, but we're just trying to offer more uh, more ways to you know contribute to college baseball. A little bit of diversity. Yeah, a little diversity. Anyways, how, how worried are you guys about Vanderbilt? By the way, like by a, the way can I say something real quick? Things? I would pay a lot of money for that hoodie. I'll just steal it. <laughs> we'll just steal it next time we're in Nashville. How can 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 we just appreciate that hoodie? <laughs> yes. Is Indeed. it just me? The thing that thing yeah, I'm, I'm I I'm, I'm with you so much that to answer Ben's question, they've got such swaggy stuff that no, I'm not worried about Vanderbilt. Not in the slightest. This was much more to do about South Carolina than it was to do about Vanderbilt. Wait, time out, time out. Do you I'm rating this hoodie literally a ten out of ten. I love that hoodie so much. Let me show this is a this is a seven out of ten max hoodie. It's a cool hoodie. It says Vandy Boys in person. The script font, Vandy Boy, big ass Nike swoosh, American flag on the side. What are you talking about? That's a seven out of ten max. I'm sorry. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Seven out of ten max. I've seen better. It would be cooler if it just said Vandy on it, to be honest. The Vandy Boys part. Why is do you guys hate Vandy like Boys? Why, I, Jack? You brought that up a couple weeks ago. You don't like it. Why? I, massive Corbin fan. I told you, I easily persuaded. Um, I don't know. It just seems kind of cheesy to me. Yeah, I, like I get it. Like I, I understand that there's this culture. Gotta, I don't know. You got to remember when it was created. It was the Carson Fulmer. It was the Vansby Swanson. It was the Tony Kemp. It was the Car. Uh, um, Tyler Beatty, it would be, uh, yeah, but Vander all, Wheel. yeah, but all, yeah, they're all stars and they're all they really are, stars. they were the Vandy boys, yeah, right? they're the blue blood program. But all I do, all I hear when I hear Vandy boys is Fetty Wap when it's like Remy boys or whatever the fuck he did. That's all I think about. So you're just being a hater, dude. You're just being a hater, dude. I'm a massive Corbin fan. I'm gonna go sit no, in Corbin fan and Vanderbilt fan are two different, are can be mutually exclusive. No, I'm a big Vandy fan. I think they're nasty. I think they're going to be A-OK. -okay. Vanderbilt SID, if you're watching this or listening right now, I have your back. So shout I would love a hoodie in my mailbox in the near future. I have your back. Uh, shout out to my boy, Will Owen, who helped me get all those interviews. Alon Espinal, absolute monster behind the play. Big fan. I'm telling you. I'll, the, pencil I'll talk, talk. the pencil talk versus pen talk rivalry is real right now. He's so real. Already, the 13 minutes in bickering at each other. Um, last thing we're going to say about this series, uh, if like, do you guys think that South Carolina is the better team or did Vanderbilt nope. run into a founders park that was, uh, a little hostile, a little rowdy and just maybe Vanderbilt struggled. I think, I think that series is literally exactly what we saw last year when they beat Florida, they swept Florida at home. We said put a number one Nick to their name and put some respect on that South Carolina Gamecock. I think it's very similar. I think they're going to struggle this year. And now, look, here we are again, making another hot take, and I'm probably going to look stupid in three weeks from now. But I think that this is one of those series where it just shows you the depths of the SEC. If you don't show up one weekend, you get your ass kicked. I don't think yeah. this weekend showed so much about how good South Carolina is. We all knew they're good, but great, like Arkansas level, Oregon State level, Florida level. I mean – you would, I'd have to see more. I'd have to see more consistency out of them because they had a chance against Clemson, didn't do it. They had a chance against Ole Miss, didn't do it. So I think this is more of just showing how good the SEC is week in, week out. Not so much the South Carolina, the top ten team in the country. Before we Fair move enough. off of them, before we move off of them, I, I felt like all three of us were on the same page about the two. I felt like sleepers going into this SEC season. A and M, South Carolina. A and M has lived up to some of those like sleepy expectations that we kind of phrased. It's an elite offense. The pitching has stepped up. They beat the teams they were supposed to, and they moved into SEC play and have kind of done such. To me, 
what we saw from South Carolina this weekend shows that they can be like, like that is an elite offense. Like when they are one through nine deep as hell and Will Tippett sitting in the nine hole and Dylan Brewer, a Clemson transfer, is going backside, yeah, yeah, like the smooth lefty swing, they're deep. Now I'm getting excited about this team because the pitching is better than I think a lot of people said. And when I talk to a guy like Roman Kimball, who we we coined as Roy Oswald, like it's like a guy like Dylan Eskew was was hurt last year. People just see numbers. He's better this year. He's healthy. Eli Jones is far better than I think anyone thought. So I think you, yes, the SEC is really deep. And if South Carolina has a couple blow up innings like they did a week ago. They can get their tits kicked in a little bit too, but they can be really elite like we talked about Texas A&M as well. Let me let me I'm going to put a question out. I want both of your reaction. All right. Or thoughts. When you look at Arkansas, what do you think of? Consistency? Just consistent all the damn time? Not I, really. I think immediately of just like great pitching. Yeah, okay. pitching is but over the, over the years, over the last three or four years, what do you think of? Oh, it's, but it's a program. Yeah. All right. When you think of some of these programs, you think they're so damn consistent. When you think of South Carolina, you think, oh, my God, this team could be really good. But the next weekend, they look horrendous. Arkansas, you never really see the horrendous. You never just see, oh, my God, this team is so bad this weekend. Are they even good? Is that a, is that a testament to the head coach and the coaching staff? I think that's a – I don't know, dude. That's a tough question. Like, I think that might be a unanswerable question, if that makes but why, sense. But why can't they be more consistent? That's what well, I'm my, my answer is no and only because – I don't think it has anything to do with the coaching staff. I think they're in a great spot. We we asked the same questions about Ole Miss and Mississippi State. Are you are we questioning their coaching staffs? I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think – I don't think – I I don't think uh, Lamonis – is the long-term answer there. That's just personal opinion. I like him. He's a great guy, like whatever. But just objectively speaking, when you come in and win a national championship with a previous regime player, and then all of a sudden you fall off a cliff, something's got to give there, right? Yeah. I don't know. That's a whole other conversation. So, but, but anyway, back to my point. I think coaching staff do play a part in consistency. In play in game prep uh, during the week practice rep uh, prep, like I think coaching staff keep your players' mindset even keel, don't ride the wave up and down, stuff like that. So I do when I think of South Carolina, I think can, is Mark Kingston a bad coach? No, not at all by any means. He is where he is because he was good. At, he's good at what he does, but it's like consistency. Where is it? Why do some programs have it? Some don't. Like, South Carolina can be just as good as Arkansas. I think South Carolina can out-recruit Arkansas. I think their brand holds that much weight where they could out-recruit Arkansas, mano y mano. But Arkansas is the one that's the consistent program year in and year out. But, like, all right, so I after this, I'm trying to answer this. we got to move on because we, yeah. we've spent a lot of time on this. But, like, consistency is great and all, but I guarantee you, like, I would – if I was an SEC fan, I would rather see the up and downs if that means, like, win a national championship. Like, think, for example, like Kevin O'Sullivan at Florida. He's been very inconsistent. Like, his teams do not show up sometimes. They do show up sometimes. But, he like, he won a national championship six years ago and, like, almost won one last year. Um, like, the programs that go up and down, I don't think you can complain about. Mississippi State, Ole Miss, they both won national championships. They've been up and down. A team like Arkansas has not won a national championship. Um, like what the about consistent Oregon State? programs, a team like Oregon State. Right. I mean, I think that they're kind of inconsistent recently. I mean, they they, like, they, they haven't made it to Omaha since 2018. I, I just I'll, I'll put it like this, and then let's let's kick it to the rest of the SEC, and we'll use this as a perfect transition. I think the inconsistencies that you see in the SEC are a testament to the fact that you're damn near playing a double A schedule. You get everybody's best every weekend. You're looking at top five rounders every Friday night. <laughs> it's impossible to be perfect in college baseball, and it sure as hell is impossible to be perfect against the best competition in the world. That's, I mean, that's I mean, that's what I, that's why I'm bringing this up. Arkansas went nearly perfect, and then they got beat by NC State in 2021. Hey, this is the college uh -oh. baseball podcast. We are not watching college basketball right now. What happened? What happened? Well, Jack just made the biggest face of all time. 
You're right. College basketball doesn't matter, but if they hit a three to send it to overtime, A and M Houston with just 0.4 seconds on the clock, we're on overtime. Buzzer beater. Hold on. I, I, I'm way behind you. I got 1.2 right. seconds left. They're just about to inbound the ball. Should we talk a little A and M baseball? He may no. Know. That's pretty sick. Um, all right, let's do this. We're gonna we're gonna jump away from the SEC. I'm gonna go down the road from South Carolina. The biggest weekend series, in my opinion, was this Florida State versus Clemson series. And I'm embarrassed it took us 20 minutes to get there. But, I mean, sometimes we just got to rattle off some, some opinions before we get dive into the, you know, the stats and, like, everything that happened in, in the you series. You got to bite through the bun to get to the meat. Yeah, right, right. Um, so, Demetri, you did a really good job covering it on, on Twitter. Uh, this series was the craziest series I can remember as far as having huge leads – and blowing them, and it just happened that Florida State blew three really big leads. Um, there was, I was looking at like the six four three charts thing. Florida State had a ninety nine point nine percent chance to win on Saturday, and they gave up eight or seven or eight in the ninth and lost. Eight. It. Yeah, but the weekend eight to one and lost. Yeah, yeah. The uh, I mean Blake Blake Wright won the weekend. Uh, over his last, what do you have? Twenty one RBIs this weekend. Two grand no, slams this uh, this week. This week, yeah, this week twenty-one games. RBIs in four games. I mean, he every time he stepped to the plate, he made freaking damage. And uh, I mean, he put the Clemson team on his back for the most part. I mean, he was the he was the run producer, the run driver, in. like he was the guy that they leaned on. And, and Florida State's bullpen looked very bad, like e- embarrassingly bad for an undefeated team coming into that weekend. But, again, it was the formula that we talked about. Every time an undefeated team goes into a place on the road, a uh, tough environment, it feels like they always lose two out of three at least. And we said it last podcast, unfortunately, Florida State had a chance to win all three games, and they just didn't. So what does this say for you guys, for both teams, Florida State and Clemson? Um, for Clemson, it showed me. They're good. That 18-1 to loss to Kennesaw State fluke. Who cares? Don't pretend it never happened. Because for me, that's all I think about. Like, oh, Clemson's good, but like they struggled against these teams, got their shit kicked in by Kennesaw State, stuff like that. So I'm, like, thinking, like, is, is Clemson good? How good are they? This weekend show me they are – they can hit with anybody in the country. Pitching, I'm still, I'm still skeptical on their pitching. It's going to be fine. Not every team has the big league pitching staff. So for that, that's Clemson. But for me, Florida State, don't let don't get it twisted. This is a really good team that just got their bullpen exposed, like at the worst of the worst. I mean, fly, I mean, three fly balls were to left field. The Hill at Clemson ate three dudes alive. They yeah. missed three fly balls in left field. The guys like whatever, and the wind was blowing, whatever. So, I mean, I, I don't I don't think you can sit here and say, oh, Florida State sucks, D1 baseball was right, not having them ranked. They are a top 25 team. They just got to get their bullpen figured out. Maybe they brought the wrong guys in at the wrong time, whatever it is, because this lineup hits with anybody in the country as well. Yeah, I, I think to me, too, uh, I think we might be the ultimate jinx. I said that I didn't believe in the star power up at Clemson, South Carolina. I think they had it. Mr. Wright. Will Taylor, uh, who's an absolute phenom, uh, they've got absolute dogs in that lineup. I do think there are a lot of question marks still, like on the front end, like who do I fear on Friday night when they tow the rubber? But I, like, what a game of the week, like game of the year type candidate vibes, and they do it twice in two days. Um, that shit was crazy. Like, and I'm hesitant because the only thing that I'm scared to do now is is. It comes has got to be the number one team in the country, right? And the minute that we say this, I fully expect them to lose five straight because um, that's what we do on this podcast. But um, I, they they look like the number one team in the country right now. Well, dude, it's it's actually kind of crazy because right now, this is why college baseball is in such a prime spot. You can make an argument for three teams in three different conferences all to be the number one team in the nation: Clemson out of the ACC, Arkansas out of the SEC, and Oregon State out of the Pac-12. All three have good resumes, like really solid resumes. They win games that they're supposed to, um, plus games they're not supposed to. And they all three are just constructed so differently. Clemson's more of like a balanced team, in my opinion, maybe slightly leaning offensive. Arkansas, pitching heavy. Offense is getting around finally, we think. 
And then Oregon State puts up 15 runs against everybody. Pitching staff is just a little. Dude, every episode with this shit. What happened? Shit scares me. I'm like looking around, like, what is happening? What was it, no, Alexa? It yeah, it was Alexa. Oh. oh, well. Well, we need a fourth chair, so we'll just have Alexa on here. Um, but, anyways, like, I mean, I think it's going to be a good argument for all three teams. Uh, Right now, personally, I think Arkansas still deserves to be number one. You go to Auburn, win two out of three. Could have won a third. They could have swept. Uh, But this Clemson team, only two losses on the year. This is is a team that just refuses to lose. I mean, they just – that's what I'm saying. I mean, that South Carolina theory, they came back. um, Andrew Shufo off of Ganey walk-off bomb. They tied it late in the game. It was just very similar. And then the Duke series. Duke had a lead. Clemson came back, tied it up, held up, held on and won late in the game. I mean, it just showed the team never out of it. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny is, like, 30 minutes before... Was it 30 minutes before or 30 minutes after when Duke blew that seven-run lead in the ninth to NC State? After. They both happened within like minutes of each other. It's crazy. Yeah, Pennington hit two home runs in one inning. They go six runs in the ninth and like literally 30 minutes after in the same damn conference, same caliber of stars. That game was equally as wild. But I, I want to shout out the Riz God too, making the Clemson graphic. I mean, are we? I know they retracted it, but still kind of dope. Wait, what? Getting getting your tweet up on the Clemson oh, graphic. Oh, 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 oh. Let's see if I can find it. I think it's right here. For those listening along, for the people Clemson that are wondering what um, this the hell the long chomp is talking about. Oh yeah, here it is, right there. Oh shit, I'm not sharing. Uh, so basically, yeah, I mean they uh, they put out a graphic, a bunch of different people shock us: Clemson six four three, Aaron Fit, Kendall Rogers. And then there's us in the top right. Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. Somebody didn't like that. And uh, they deleted that graphic and put up this one with no tweets. I'm not a fan That's of that. Cool. Move. Stick, by, stick with your gun. Yeah. Um, let's move away from the Clemson series. That was awesome. I was the only one to pick him to win two out of three in the weekend series. Pick him. Thank you very much. Um, but the, the next biggest series, and maybe it was equally as big as the other ones, was down at the – the box like alex box stadium lsu hosting florida people are livid on twitter including myself i guess i can add myself there that a nine loss florida team is still ranked in the top 10 but after losing friday i mean pretty handily they come back and win saturday and extras tags hits an extra inning homer that was i don't know the the exit velocity but it looked like 115 off the bat Line drive, piss missile over right center. And he comes back today, catches lights out, hits a backside homer off the scoreboard. Um, I mean, he was just locked in, ready to go. Like, he was the guy that everybody needed. And, like, everybody was expecting this Florida team to play like this all year. Uh, run rule LSU. LSU's second run rule on a Sunday in SEC play. They got run ruled last week by Mississippi State. Um, so they really need to figure out that Thatcher Hurd start uh, on, on Sundays. But anyways, like, I think this showed a lot about the Florida Gators. Like, sure, in the midweeks, they're going to sleepwalk, and they're not going to care. But when it comes to the weekend, they find a way to win two out of three every single weekend. Uh, And a lot of the credit goes to Jack Caglione on Sundays. They just don't lose on Sundays. He's a guaranteed win right now. He'll go six, seven innings, uh, two runs or less, and strike out a handful, like a couple handfuls, eight to ten. It's crazy. I mean – I mean, it's the best player in the country. Guy hit the home run today. Guy throws seven innings of two-run ball. Weekend before, he went, I don't know, six innings of one-run ball, maybe, something like that. Like, And he'll, he'll, he, I think he hit better when he's pitching. That's what I'm starting to notice. I don't know if it's actually statistically true, but it seems like it. Last year for sure. It was something like that last year. I don't know how many stats to back it up, but the eyeball test, it feels like it. I mean, this Florida team's good, man. They're loaded in the lineup one through nine as well. I mean, Ty Evans, Colby Shelton, Jack Caglione, oh, oh shit, Caglione, um, and 
some other. Yeah, I mean, I think the Florida team is good, man. I, I at this point we just say fuck it. Who cares about Tuesday? Yeah. Does it worry you though? It was, that if they get into the losers bracket, like that Tuesday is really like the game four in a regional. Like you have to win that game four if you're in the losers bracket. Who's gonna step up and win it? That's like that's really the only importance for me for midweeks. For but the, I think the top the like if they lose in the midweeks, if they do lose in the postseason, they're gonna have to rely on those midweek guys to uh, to win a game or two. So I mean, you remember what's his name? The lefty. He came in in that Oklahoma game. Starter got knocked out in the first. They gave up like four runs in that regional or that game. Lefty came in and threw nine complete nine shutout innings out of the bullpen. You remember that, Ben? Yeah. He came in through nine shutout. Florida won fourth the game seven in that regional. So I think experience will come down when it gets to May. Weather warms up. I think Florida will be just fine. Right now they're getting exposed, but they're getting meaningful failure, if that makes sense. They're failing a lot now. At that point, you're just like, dude, whatever. If I fail again, I've been failing all year. There's no pressure on them to get the experience. I think they'll be just fine when we get to May in June. That series was really fun, too, because there's, like, future major leaguers in both dugouts, like, almost double-digit dudes, too. Like, you were all over Neely coming out of the back end today. Like, he was nails. Um, And I have a question I want to stage, but – I'm not worried about LSU. And I know a lot of people in Baton Rouge are probably getting starting to get a little concerned. My only fear is that unfortunately they have to go to Arkansas next week. That's the gonna be a problem. gets tough. It you're not really, worried. Can you tell me no, why you're not worried? No, and I'll tell you why, because like, I think everyone knows like their dog, like bear Jones is a freak. Like he ran a bunch of balls out. Tommy White's rake and Travinsky's like leading the country and, and OBP and so like OPS. Like he's, they're fine. The only, I, I seriously, the only problem I'm worried about is, I think Thatcher Hurd actually looks pretty good today. I'm worried about the back end bullpen on Sundays. Like they throw their best guys behind Holman and, and jump on Friday, <laughs> Saturday. But like a guy like Josh Pearson to me, who plays right, plays left, played second base today, hit a backside double against Cags and like the sixth to lead off at any. Like those guys are developing at a really rapid rate. They're like, I really like their lineup. So I'm cool. I'm like, I'm not, I'm really not worried about LSU. The guys around Cags this weekend were incredible. Like, Ty Evans was nuts. Like, that was the Ty Evans that we saw dominate in Omaha last year. That was a reason that Florida's able to fly through their side of the bracket. So, I'm really impressed with the rest of the lineup with Florida. I don't understand why they look so fucking measly during the midweeks. But, again, to y'all's point, who cares? Um I'm interested. They talked about it a little bit on the broadcast today. And we, we don't have to touch on it long. Does Cags two way at the next level? Like, is he a show? Can he? Is he good enough to pitch? Because today he they didn't have let it happen. He walked six today, but then you look up and he's only given up two hits, and you're like, "Does this play?" I'm so, I'm really interested to see what happens. I so I looked at a scout this weekend about that. Like, what do you think about? Um, I was like, "What do you think about Cags? Like, is he going to go number one overall?" Because people think he might be on the path that Shohei. And he basically brought like broke it down to me like this. You're buying the bat. Like you're buying the athlete, you're buying the bat. If the pitching like works out and if if his organization, I'm not going to say what team he was with, but his organization wants him to pitch and try to do both, but he's like the pitching will be the first to go. Like it doesn't matter how bad he's hitting or how good he's pitching. If he feels like he can't handle both or the organization feels like you can't handle both, then they're going to cut out pitching, even if he's doing it better at that level. Because yeah. then they're like, all right, focus on hitting only. So you're buying the bat um, and, and you're buying the athlete. So, like, sure, I think there's going to be some teams that look at having him. Because you think about it. He's a first-rounder on the mound. He's a first-rounder at the plate. If you have a first overall pick, you're basically getting two first-rounders with for the price of one. Now, you might have to pay a little extra, but – it's like having two first round picks here. So I think they're going to let him try. It would be hard for an organization to draft him and not let him try. Cause it's like, why are you paying him millions and millions of dollars? But the, the thing is if, if the hitting is struggling or if he like mentally or physically cannot do it, they're going to cut pitching out first. And they're going to say, all right, you're going to be playing 162 games versus just 35. Like that's the way that they're going to look at it. 
My question is, he, his leash is going to be so short that I don't even think he's going to have a chance. Because when you get to pro ball, a lot of guys face a transition problem where it takes a little bit to get used to the next level. I mean, look at it. Paul Skeen, I mean, I'm not saying Paul Skeen is struggling or anything, and Dylan Cruz, Cruz struggling a little bit. Wyatt Langford is the first one in the big league of those three. It's, it's, it's literally some guy transitions quick, some guys are in a different organization. So I think it's not going to be fair because Otani already did it for so long at a high level in Japan. Big league teams are like, okay, we got it. If he struggles at the plate, it's fine. It'll come around. There's enough data to show that he can do it. They're not going to – Cags will never get that opportunity. So I think it's unfair. I think if he went to – So what you're saying is Cags should be playing in Japan for a few years and do both. <laughs> he had a higher chance of doing both in the big league if he were to do that. Correct. I mean, that's not too much of a hot take. I no, was kind of joking around. You know but... how they are. You know how they are. They're going to change some mechanics in his pitching. They're going to try to change something in his hitting. They just – they can't help themselves. That's what they do. And – it's gonna he's, he's gonna struggle to do both. If they just let him go and do both, like he's been doing for three years of Florida, he had the better shot of doing it. But they they can't help themselves. Okay. Well, I don't want to speak on any organizations in MLB. No, but just in general, like that's that's, the, that's what I'm expecting to happen. He's gonna struggle twice in pitching, three times in pitching, and everything. Up, oh, up. Oh, that's enough. No more. That's enough. Go hit. And it's like, dude, he he just barely he didn't even get a shot. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting, but this brings up the conversation. This brings up the conversation. Is is Cags like should he be the favorite to win the Golden Spikes, or are you looking at a guy like Charlie Condon, who again just massive weekend, seventeen homers. I mean, we still have thirty five games left ish. It, it's crazy. Like, he's gonna hit over. He's gonna break Cags's record from last year. He's well on pace too. Let me ask you this: Is the Golden Spike the most valuable player to one of the best teams in the country, or is it just no, the best statistical season? It's neither. It's the most outstanding amateur baseball player. That's what the that's what it says. Well, I mean, I don't think anybody's more outstanding than pitching six, seven inning the one run ball at Alex Box Stadium, going one for three with a home run, and doing it week in and week out. Like, there's nothing more outstanding than that. So, how can Charlie Condon even compete with that? I completely agree, but it's the same idea of like LeBron James could have win the MVP in the NBA every single year because you take him off his roster and they suck. We have become immune to the amazing. Yep. Like what Cags is doing is what he did last year, and you're like, oh man, this guy's so sick. Condon's a new household name. Condon's in over 500 two weeks in it. Like this is stupid stuff. Okay. So I agree with you. Of course. There's nobody on the planet that can do what Jack Cags is doing. But what Condon is doing is Chris Burke, like there's this idea of like letting the moment breathe in a broadcast. Him laughing at Condon's homer that cleared the batter's eye to win it was so beautiful. So shout out to Berkey for letting that moment happen because what he's doing right now is nuts. No, it, it, It's crazy stuff. Um, I think it'll all figure itself out, to be honest. Like, it's way too early to crown somebody the favorite. or I mean, maybe not crown the favorite, but crown somebody the Golden Spikes. I mean, what Travis Bazana is doing right now at Oregon State is crazy. Four straight games with a leadoff homer. Um, just catalyst of that offense, putting up 12 runs a game. Uh, and you, 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 there's, there's several other guys. Like Hagen Smith, what he's doing is Paul Skeens has. Chase Burns, what he's doing is what like Paul Skeens did. There's so many players out there across the country that are putting up these ridiculous stat lines and look like the most outstanding player. Yeah, me, for me, though, like Jack Caglione is doing it from both sides of the ball right now. Let me give you another reason why Jack Cag is the Golden Spikes. Nobody else has a chance. Peyton Tolly doesn't even hit on Fridays anymore because he can't handle doing both. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was shoved on Friday, though. He but he can't right? hit. He's not hitting anymore on Friday. That's fine. You get the eight. Because CG. it is so hard to do. And Jack Cag does it every damn weekend. Yeah, CG Shuddy for Tali, though, and the, and the Frogs in a much need he, win. He on the great. But this, this, that's not the point I'm trying to make here. He is not even hitting on the games he pitches anymore. Dude, you're, you're, we've got three guys in this podcast. One that pitched, two that hit. None of us 
or even an iota of what this guy can do. And he can do a fucking both at the, at the most elite level. There's no arguing yeah. that it's the most athletic, incredible human being on the planet. Size 17 shoe. Yeah, I understand he's letting it hang all over the forehead of college baseball right now. The guy's crazy. I, I agree. I agree. Um, I would bet let's, talk about our, let's, let's talk about our trip. Um, we, we made a... I don't want to phrase this. We we did something that was so last minute. Um, I obviously had to do some work up in North Carolina for my full time job. Um, shout out to Team Funded. If you're interested in doing fundraisers for high school travel ball or middle school, doesn't matter. Uh, or college. We do colleges too. Email me Ben at TeamFunded.com. I've been helping out people all across the southeast. Actually, all across the country. But anyway, so I had to do some work up in North Carolina, and uh, Jack had to do a broadcast at NC State, NC State Duke on, on Friday. And uh, it just kind of worked out where I was able to do some work and, and visit some ballparks I've never seen before in those areas and jump, got to do his full-time job of broadcasting on ACC Network. Um, but the point I want to make, it, it, it lined up perfectly. Uh, after work Thursday, drove up to Wake Forest, Winston-Salem, got to see the, the couch in person, beautiful ballpark small but it, it's actually it looks bigger in person than it does on tv uh center field looks actually like pretty deep and there were there wasn't as many bp homers as i expected uh but we got to see wake forest against louisville jack did an awesome interview with uh coach dan mcdonald gave him like a ton of time like they they chatted for a long time plus did a five minute interview it'll be released sometime this week and um so that was a cool experience getting to meet the legend dan mcdonald but to sit down and, and see this Wake Forest team in person has me buying back into them. Like, they are a bunch of, like, freak athletes. Uh, they can really hit the ball. The bullpen looked much better this weekend. Uh, I think this is a perfect time to buy high or buy low on Wake Forest because I think they're about to turn it around. Rough couple weeks to start ACC play, but they looked back to form at home. Um, but I guess the point that I want to make, we, we started there – thursday for that for that louisville game got to meet some awesome 11.7 fans that's uh we got to meet micah from fifth quarter acc uh he runs a, a website podcast and everything he was wearing the rake forest tee we saw him on the concourse that was that was a cool moment and uh sat with him behind home plate at his seats and uh after the game we got to go interview you know wake forest players and and sit in the press room with uh coach walter and that was just a cool experience for me. And we we kind of parlayed that into morning going down the street, like early in the morning, like 8 a.m. Before I had to go do some some stuff at work, uh, we got to go drive down the road to uh, to High Point University and meet with Coach Hammond there. Joey Hammond, absolute legend, like future Power Five coach in my opinion. Uh, but High Point's campus, if you guys are not aware might be the most beautiful campus in in america like it is high dollar super rich um awesome campus great baseball facilities one of the best mid-major baseball facilities i think out there in the country um with the locker rooms the the clubhouse the weight room field playing service everything was awesome and uh from there i had to go do some work towards the raleigh like greenville area so we went took jack to his acc broadcast with darren vaught another person i've known him on twitter for five years finally got to meet him in person jack got to call a game with him and uh that game was fun we got to see sam highfield shove we got to see uh jonathan santucci like in person it was cool it was a great moment um and then from then we we hung out with my buddy from high school for a little mm -hmm. bit and then uh went over to the unc georgia tech series so in chapel hill so that's kind of the rundown of what we did. Came back home, but let's let's kind of touch on this. Jack, is there anything the audience needs to know about your experience this week? Um, because you got to go to some ballparks you've never been to either, and uh, interview some really cool people on, on on your own time. Like pencil talk was popping apparently. Yeah. Seaver King is a bona fide big leaguer. Like that was I'm a so fun. bought in on Seaver King. Oh, he just oozes big leaguer. Like, and he was super down to earth and like was really brutally honest about like, yeah, we're just trying to find our identity. Like, that's why they bleach the hair. Like, we're just trying to be us. 
Uh, that was really cool, like, to get that honesty. And, like, they're working through it. And you're like, oh, it's coming. Get a ball 117 miles per hour to right center field. Like, that was crazy. He's one of the guys that, that when you meet him in person and, like, look at him in his eyes, he is a future Major League Baseball player. Like, you can just tell the presence is there. Athletic ability is there. He had an unbelievable game that day, too. Um, but, I mean, I think he's Mookie Betts 2.0. Play him in center field, play him at shortstop, play him at second, play him at third. It doesn't matter. Like, he'll play anywhere on the field. He's the best athlete. Um, he was really, it was a cool one to meet and, and talk to in person. Yeah, he was sweet. Joe, uh, Coach Hammond at High Point was awesome the next morning. They were super, like, allowing us to be accessible. So if you're a mid-major school and you want us to come show love to your program, you're talking to three mid-major guys. Like, we want to help tell your story. Let us come. Uh, we got to meet some of the most interesting people. Kale Chatham, he might be the next big South show. Hey, Jack Cags can't hold Kale Chatham, the LaGrange guy. He walks up to Star Wars. This is our guy. And then we got to interview a young man by the name of the redneck Ichiro. That interview coming out next week as well. I, I can't even begin to give you the Spark Notes version of that interview. You'll just have to go watch. Uh, and then, yeah, parlaying that into my first ever ACC Network broadcast was really cool. Santucci goes five and two-thirds of no-hit baseball. Hypothetically, may walk may have walked seven, but we're not too worried about that. No-hit baseball. Um, and, and NC State, like, gets a big-time serious victory over a top-10 Duke team. And, and that, to me, kind of served as, like, the theme of really everywhere in the country, which was – Teams getting their teeth kicked in a week before, showing up and winning these massive weekend sets that you kind of felt like the sky was falling. Oh, wait, we're okay. Sam Highfield retained his possession as mayor of Raleigh, told DJ Burns to back off. Uh, no basketball talk. Um, Makarevich was a cool dude. Oh. Real cool dude. Makarevich was a great interview. The East Carolina transfer leading the country in RBIs right now, but getting to talk to Ben and I, like, big fan of the brand. We're a big fan of his before we even like getting to know him. But what a like a super genuine, authentic dude of like, I just wanted to like try to grow a little bit and, and see what would happen. So talking to him was a lot of fun. Yeah. Love and it, then, love it. hey, I'll say this right now. Like, um, you know, briefly yesterday, seeing the, uh, the UNC field and UNC's campus. Dude, I mean, that's that's as big time as it gets. Like Chapel Hill. I, it was it kind of blew me away. Now, listen, NC State's field was really cool. Wake Forest's field was really cool. Uh, UNC almost felt like they had a minor league field on campus right across from dorm rooms, and it was like everything was so compact together. You just walk across campus. It's right there. Um, I mean, it was top notch. I, Think about the history of that campus, though. Michael yeah. Jordan grade those, those campus grounds. Like a lot of big time people have been walking Dude. down the sidewalk. Riz got so because Drew Bias might have been the greatest athlete to ever walk on that campus. He was <laughs> peppering balls over the scoreboard. It was insane in BP. He was crazy. Riz, I'm so glad you brought that up. We're on FaceTime with Dimitri while we're at the Bosch. Ben and I are just kind of taking it in. I got to play there once. Ben's kind of his first trip, but like getting to really like soak it in. And then you see him like even roll out for BP in the Carolina blue. And like when you close your eyes and you think of the college experience, I, I know so many schools in North Carolina are probably hating on us for like blowing North Carolina's tires right now, but it's true. Like it is such a college campus, football, basketball, baseball are all within walking distance. The dorms are right there. Are you not talking about Honeycutt? Well, no, I'm just talking about the school. In no, general. but, but you, you were talking about Honeycutt, right? Well, and then you get to a guy that is like quite literally like the all American American <laughs> in Vance County Cut, the flow, the center fielder. I'm not going to touch on it if Ben wants to, he can. The ball he hit out was hit 130 miles per hour. No one can tell me it was hit any less. Like he's a freak. They were fun. Georgia Tech's going to be great, by the way. They got a lot of really young studs. And I'm excited to see what they do. I mean, Burst is crazy, but the guys around them are really good too. But Ben, you're a big Honeycutt fan, aren't you? Yeah, I'm glad Jack brought this up. Um, so I'm I'm like known as being the jinx, right? Like I'm the guy that you go to if you want the opposite to happen. And you know, he's over the couple games, like some scouts got familiar with like my face, and they saw me, and they would ask, like, "Are you a scout?" Like 
what are you doing here? Like, oh, I'm just stopping by. I want to see the facilities real quick. I'm in the area. Um, love college baseball. You know, you start talking to them, and then you know, it, sure enough, it leads to like, all right, yeah, like you know what you're what you know what you're doing, but you're not a scout. But like, what do you think about some of these guys? Like, they're like, oh, you run a college baseball page. That's cool. What do you think about like I'm I was sent here from Philadelphia to go watch Vance Honeycutt in person. You know, my boss wanted me to come down here. Like that's the conversation. So man, I had the balls to say, you know what? Like, I think Vance Honeycutt is one of the guys that like you he's an athlete. Like he's definitely a guy that can get there at the next level. I just say I'm not as big of a buyer on him as I feel like a lot of people are. Like I think there's still a lot of doubts in pro ball. Like once he gets there, because he's inconsistent with the swing sometimes. Like he takes a completely different swing, like at bat to at bat. Sometimes he looks comfortable, sometimes he doesn't. And I said last year he didn't make the adjustment from the freshman to the sophomore year. You know, I'd like to see him, you know, get back to like what he was his freshman year at the plate and and make adjustments to the pitching. Well, like I couldn't even finish my sentence and he hits a ball <laughs> deadline, eight feet off the ground the whole way for a two run homer. And like the scout just kind of looked at me, smiled and was just like, all right, dude, thanks. Thanks for your input. But I, I think I'm going to trust my own eyes. So yeah, I got, I got humbled pretty big. Hey there. dude, your yeah. two seconds of an MLB scout just came and went so fast. No, I, all yeah. kidding aside, all kidding aside, walking around and having those conversations, Demetri, you and Ben both like you could do that job tomorrow. Like, I love to tell the stories of it. I don't have like the historical knowledge and, and I know the game, but like the names piece you two could do in a heartbeat. Like I think I think what I was saying as he hit that homer was yeah, I got him as like a Drew Stubbs type, like a really good college player, free <laughs> athlete. Um, maybe not an MLB all star. <laughs> oh. And I'm just like, dang it, dude, I can never get out of my own way. No, but you know what you did say, though, which was true. So, Demetri, when we FaceTimed you and we were like, I think for anyone who's listening to us at this point, this game is a diehard college baseball fan, too. Like, we're walking around, like, their Hall of Fame room, which is basically all of their pro guys, every first through third round or anyone who's ever made a 40-man, like – and we're just like kind of like we're like giddy. It's like a kid on Christmas morning. And we're looking at the bats from the College World Series and like Matt Harvey's game wore an all-star game jersey. And all these guys, Ackley and Miller and Stone, and Colin Moran and Sky Bolt and all these guys. And Ben kind of ushered in this idea of like Ohio State quarterbacks are really talented and they win Heisman's and like Troy Smith never played it down as a starting quarterback. There was this idea, right? until there's a cj stroud you just don't know like there hasn't been like a north carolina like freak I said, yeah i, I i'm you glad know? you brought that up too jack i said there hasn't really been uh, there might not have been a north carolina like unc player mlb an Astros legend, ken emmanuel yeah well, ken emmanuel, no, but i'm saying position player okay. like there hasn't been a north carolina position player uh that i can think of there might have been some all stars other than Kyle Seager. Seager. Yeah, Seager's probably the most successful. North I mean, Carolina. I think Dustin Ackley had a perfectly great career. That's what I'm saying, though. But like most of the UNC guys that get drafted in the first round, second round, are the Colin Morans, the Dustin Ackleys, the uh, uh, Jacob Stallings, like Andrew you know, Miller, position players, Dimitri. Oh. Position players. <laughs> the pitchers are fine. I mean, look at Zach Gallen and. Um, Matt Harvey, like those guys were awesome all stars, like Cy Young contenders. But the position Here's, players don't really pan out the way like they're Ohio State quarterbacks. Here, dude, 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 that is so unfair. To hold on, Jack, that is so unfair to compare the Ohio State quarterback to the careers of Dustin Ackley and Corey Seager. Like we're talking NFL plus and very serviceable big leaguer. Like yeah, well. We're not talking. We're not talking Juan Soto's and Aaron Judge's and Mike Trout like career here, once in a lifetime. Here's Demetri. Here's what we'll sum up because again, this was a trip for both of us. Like, hey, we're doing a little prospecting and scouting for where we can do some college game day, fill out the cultures, create some relationships we can cultivate, and dominate this space. Everything we heard from everyone outside of Chapel Hill, they're the Yankees, they're the Lakers, they're the Cowboys. It's the Tar Heels. 
that's how everyone views him. So that's what he kind of meant is like, I want like if they're the if they're the Yankees, why haven't we gotten like a Mike Trout or a Hart? Like I didn't think that's kind of what I want a superstar, right? I want an all star. That's kind of what he meant because that really is, and, and I I don't mean it's a bad thing. I mean, I they sorry. are the Carolina Tar Heels, not just everyone them. in the state. If you're not wearing Carolina blue, you're probably hating the guys in Carolina blue. Is what yeah. we kind of picked up on, honestly. You want to know something funny about this? I was talking to an East Carolina guy, I want to say about a year ago. So many people in the Carolinas hate North Carolina for this reason, especially East Carolina, because East Carolina, they're like, oh, they're the teacher. They teach our CEO. They teach our doctor. The people that go to East Carolina teach us. They are our service people for us to go make a lot of money. And the people at Carolina are the richie. They go to the country club, while the East Carolina people go to the suburb. They live in your little neighborhood. So, yeah. so there's this stigma that Carolina right. people are the uh, snobby, asshole-ish country club people, while everybody else is your making a difference in society kind of thing, like making an impact, or what, if you will. So that's yeah, the thing I learned about Carolina. You can make the same like comparisons, to, like Texas colleges, like the same things with the University of Texas versus you know everybody hates Texas. But then you have like Texas Tech, TCU, A and M, Baylor. Like they they all don't like each other, but they all hate Texas. Like that's the thing. So it's the same thing. Um, I'll tell you this: like I didn't meet any like everybody in Chapel Hill that I met. Everybody around the stadium, everybody in the stadium, they were the nicest people in the world. Like let us in, open arms, come on in. Like y'all, it was just a cool experience. I liked it a lot. Let me say this too, because I felt like we painted this generalized stereotype. Duke is known as the 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 intellects, the the brilliant, the doctors, the lawyers, and the rich, right? Seventy thousand a year. Yet there's a reason they put on a hard hat when they hit home runs. Chris Pollard has built a blue collar program. North Carolina is the same way. Getting to talk to some of the scouts upstairs, we learn stories, right? Love the story mm -hmm. piece of it. Can't be overstated enough. They got a kid, Anthony D'Onofrio, right? Honey cut and the five star catcher Stevenson. All these dogs, right? But Anthony D'Onofrio. Who's like 23? He's a fifth year, but he's got three years of eligibility. He's a Northeast guy. Has got a story that we have to find a way to get him on Club Roma and talk about. Moves home to be closer to family. Is cut multiple times. Just needed one shot to go crazy. Does he gets his shot and he transfers into Chapel Hill and now now he's a guy that's on the like like the stadium game day packages. He's hitting in the heart of the lineup. Like they've got a lot of that blue collar too that I think they wear as a chip on their shoulder. Like. Oh, they think we're pampered? Watch this. We're going to beat the shit out of you now. Yeah. Um, that is a cool story. Like He he goes Juco to Quinnipiac to, like, has nowhere to play. Emails, can I walk on at UNC? Boom, gets a spot. Now he's everyday player for him. Cool story. Should we talk about – should we go back into baseball? Because that was super fun. But, like, let's, let's – Yeah, of... I, I want to touch on one more thing. Um, dude, I think, I think I want to move to North Carolina. It was – the coolest experience, like it would be easy to, for me to do my day job there. Obviously, there's so many schools, so many people in the North Carolina area. But the the thing that we're getting close to is an 11.7 group is like we need to find a place where we can anchor down and like have a, you know, like a, a be around a bunch of schools. Right. And North Carolina might be the best state for that. As far as like everything is 30 minutes away. Like you could go to 12 different division one schools and it's like an hour, 30 minutes, an hour and a half. Like you can go from Winston-Salem to Greenville all the way across the state and pass 12 to 13 division one colleges with baseball. It was a cool experience. I'm not saying I'm going to move to North Carolina, but if you're a baseball fan, college baseball fan, and you don't know where to live, like North Carolina is the spot. And you can go up to Virginia. You can go down to, I mean, Charlotte's right there on the South Carolina border. You can go right to Columbia. It's like, I mean, it, it's nuts how many cool, like, cool baseball um, stadiums and, and baseball programs you can see all, like, within an hour radius. So that's my spiel. We can go back to baseball now. Oh, wow. I left you guys speechless. I was. It was that. Oh, good. I was waiting for my uh, lead host here to. Lead us on, lead us forward. Okay, let's let's get back into baseball. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on? We'll, we'll we'll skip ahead and then we'll go, we'll backtrack. But oh, Hunter, oh, Hines, oh, oh. Hunter Hines getting bumped by an umpire uh, after today's game, strike three. 
or was it yesterday? I'm my days are mixed up. But strike three, he questions the call. Game over. Umpire takes off his mask and actually initiates contact with Hunter Hines. Like that's a bad move. I don't, that umpire should not umpire anymore in the SEC. Like go back to the mid majors for a couple of years. That you cross the line there. That's my opinion. I think I think it was the two party incident. Hunter Hines was kind of staying in his lane, waiting for it, getting in his face. Umpire was like, "Yo, get the fuck out of my way! I'm I'm out of here. Game's over." So he was. I don't want to put 100 percent blame on the umpire, but it is his job. Just like head coaches do, they come running out and start arguing. They they move forward and backward to, to avoid contact with each other. That guy didn't avoid it, but I don't want to say he 100% initiated it. He just didn't avoid it. He was okay with making contact with him, so that's wrong. But over, overall, I don't think it's that big of a deal. That's just my opinion. I saw it the same way, Dimitri. I really did because it looked like – it. I, I hear bump, and I was like, oh, it got kind of gnarly. But I also look at it from the other side of the aisle as well, where if, if Hunter Hines had initiated it, like if it was so clearly like he walked into him, he's done. So like he's looking at at least a month suspension at least. So I'm like, there's a double standard. He's the adult, get the hell out of the way. He clearly had made it about himself, which I think leads us into another conversation that's going rampant right now with dudes getting yaboed, hitting walk-offs or hitting homers, getting ejected after games, yeah. like after doing a walk-off homer, like, there is just such little feel. Talk about Colby Branch, huh? In Georgia. Yeah. I, I don't understand the rule. Maybe you guys know more about it. I know it's a new rule, but you're not allowed to toss your helmet anymore. Like if, even if it's a walk off. No, is you that are the rule. You are. Well, so what is when you're coming home? For? You can't throw your helmet off at first base, but as you're coming around third base heading home, you can throw it off. So what did he do to get ejected? I think it was hit pin. It was oh, hit. That's stupid. The game's. I up. think I I could be totally wrong though. Well, I think you're I right. I just don't understand this rule. It, it doesn't make sense to me. And like, it, hopefully, somebody can explain it to me. But like for me, it's like such a gray area. Like, why are we having exemptions on a gray area call? Like, it should be you know black and white. Like, either you did this or you don't. But you see, some games kids get away with pimping homers, and others that they don't. So. Like, let's maybe fix this. I, I'm tired of seeing kids get ejected for something that's like a subjective call. Because yeah. like, they don't know what they can and can't do. Well, I think that's that's the entire point, right? Like, there's clearly, not to call it a specific umpire, there's clearly, I say epidemic, there's clearly initiative going across the country where guys are being told to umpire and officiate these games in a specific way, to tighten it up from a showboat standpoint. And that's why Jay Johnson got ejected from that game earlier today on Sunday, right? Air yeah, Jones. It's not, the, it's not the umpire. It's the NCAA saying, hey, here's the rule book. Yeah. And it's worth this rule book. And they that's, yeah, that's, my, that's my point. But they're not even handing the rule book. They're highlighting this gray area of objectify this moment. And if it deems unfit, you, you have the ability to can guys, but that that's where like a lot of hitters and I saw people are kind of going up in arms about like Garrett Ganey celebration after the after the big win against Vandy. They're like, oh, we can't like mow down your entire dugout, but like I can't like bad flip and take a look. I think it's all good. Garrett Ganey didn't do it at the Vanderbilt dugout. He did it at his boys. Like there was clearly like some choreography down in the locker room all about it. Um but today when Bear Jones goes yard at the box and Heyman's got words from him coming around first base and then Cags takes a little bit of an initiative on the mound to, to make that impression felt and then he's brushed back, hits a backside donger. Like the game always has policed itself, just like it did today at LSU. Why the hell do we have to have guys who probably never put on a pair of spikes feel the need to put themselves in the middle of everything? That's the biggest problem. I don't. I, I can't answer that. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I don't know. I, I need somebody to sit down and explain it to me, like I'm five years old. Like, what is the rule? And like, do the players know the rule? Because if it is like a black and white rule, like you literally cannot throw your bat in the air after a home run. Like, all right, then now it's on the players. But if it's like, if it feels like um, uh, you know, if. If the rule says like if the umpire finds it justifiable that it was initiating 
uh, controversies or whatever. Like, I don't know the right word. The word they hide behind is unsportsmanlike. Unsportsmanlike. If it's that, like, we just need to get rid of the rule or fix it. I'm tired of just seeing kids get ejected for inconsistent patterns in umpiring. Somebody can do it, but others can't. Like, it, it's stupid. Yeah. But um, let's talk about that series real quick. Uh, A&M bounces back at home. It, it got a little... Like I was expecting AM to win the first two games and maybe Mississippi State, you know, win on Sunday. Um, but the the AM line showed me a lot. Like they're they're a good team. They lost to Florida, obviously, last weekend, two out of three, but they still put up a really good fight. And we said, like, if they could have hit with runners in scoring position at, at Florida, they definitely win the series, in my opinion. They just couldn't drive the runs in home. Like they had runners on. Um, but I also want to say on the other side, like Mississippi State not getting swept on the road. That's the formula, right? Like you'll be right in the thick of things in the SEC if you win your home series good. and you don't get swept on the road. You'll be fine. So all in all, I think it was exactly how we kind of exactly how we figured it would happen. Aiden would win two out of three. Um, but yeah, no other comments for me on that. Like I, it was a good series. I think I think this weekend showed me more. And- not so much about AM. We knew they're good, but I think it showed me more about Mississippi State. They're going to be a force. I'm not going to say they're going to win the SEC West or anything, but I think that's a postseason team. As of today, they will be in the postseason as a 2C somewhere. They won't yeah, host. You want to know what's scary? If the season ended today, 13 of the 14 SEC teams would be in the tournament. Everybody's <laughs> RPI is like in the 20s right now, except for Missouri, who's like 114. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think. Mississippi State should be – they should hold their heads high. They should be excited for this season, what's to come. I think that's yeah. a team that they're going to – they can get behind and have some fun and success. I, I really I really think I'm impressed by them. Like, back-to-back weekends show they're, they're good enough to be a postseason team. Same thing for Ole Miss, too. I know they got their doors blown off twice at Tennessee, but they found a way to win the game Saturday. And you don't get swept on the road against a really good balls team like that's a I don't want to say it's a win for the weekend, but it's not a loss. Like you feel good weekend. going into the next weekend. So both yep. of those Mississippi teams are hanging around. Yeah, I, I think they'll both be in the postseason. They they've mirrored each other so far this entire year. Overreactions from their fan bases after early midweek losses early in the season. I, I mean, mean, I overreacted. I thought it was fun to do when they got swept by Austin P. It's more fun that way, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Green shoes were on go though in that Austin P series. We couldn't help ourselves. Um, but like, again, the SEC has proven that like, it's really difficult to go win on the road and you see an Alabama team, you take them out of Tuscaloosa and Georgia, who's probably going to be a fresh face in the top 25 this week is like, kind of said, Oh wait, watch out for us. Fresh, like new coaching staff, like dogs throughout the lineup. I still don't really know about their bullpen. Like, but who cares? Like they, it is, I don't want to say impossible. Like, Every weekend going into SEC play, like outside of Missouri, I go, I, just give me the home team moving forward. Like, who, I don't know. Yeah. Hey, you want to know something, scary, boys? I just realized this. After 2021, Mississippi State wins the national championship 2021. The next year they come in dead last in the SEC. 2022, Ole Miss wins the national championship. Finish dead last in the SEC. No way. No way. LSU right now has the second worst record in the SEC. <laughs> one game back from the worst record. If it happens, my God, the, that, that is the biggest <laughs> con- coincidence pattern I've ever seen. I'm not, Look, I'm not saying LSU's going to finish last. I, I, they'll be fine, in my opinion. But I'm just saying, two and four to start SEC play, plus they have Arkansas, Vanderbilt, and Tennessee the next three weeks. That ain't easy. That ain't easy. No, it's not. Um, I think they'll be fine, but food for thought. Could get out. Just a little little food for thought. thought. So if Arkansas wins the national championship this year, are you suggesting they just, boys, 25, we're packing it in. We're not even going to play. Hey, I I, got to say this. Can we get off the SEC? We got to talk about the ACC here. No, no, I want to bring up something before the ACC. Um, because about this time, people turn off our episodes anyway. So this is a no-risk uh, question I'm about to ask. Jack brought this up pre, pre-show. pre When was the last time that Campbell, Southern Miss, Coastal Carolina, and East Carolina 
all lost a weekend series in conference the same weekend. I would just guess fit 10 years. There, there has got to be, I, I'm not going to look it up. I'm assuming you guys aren't going to look it up, but there is probably a diehard college baseball fan with this answer. If you have this answer, DM us, tweet at us. That is information we need to know because not only did it make our mid-major top 25 impossible today to do, I mean, these are four cream of the crop mid-major non-power five programs in the country, and they have been for the last, I mean, some of them two decades, some of them a decade, but the Campbell Camels losing two out of three at home to Delaware was a big eye-opener. Now, Delaware's a lot better team than people might think. Uh, they actually have some really good talent, So, but still, inexcusable. Like Campbell's got to win at home two out of three against Delaware. Some of their miss looked really bad against uh, Georgia Southern that first game. They got run ruled, lo- lose the series. Statesboro is a tough place to play. People know that. Coastal Carolina losing two out of three against App State, almost getting swept. Had to come extra back and win an extra. Tonight. Yeah, had to come back and win an extras. That caught me off guard. And then East Carolina losing two out of three on the road to UTSA. That's a trap place to play, first of all. They, uh, UTSA Stadium is like kind of, uh, I mean, it's, it's getting better, but it's ultimately like a uh, Texas high school baseball stadium. Like that's kind of what it looks like on average. Maybe the environment got to ECU. Maybe UTSA is finally hitting the stride that a lot of people expected this year um, because I think they will be good. They've had some bad losses early in the year, but all four of them losing the same weekend in conference play is nuts to me. Add Santa Barbara to that list. And Dude. Santa Barbara, too. Santa Barbara loses two out of three to Cal Poly. The team that couldn't score a run against Texas all weekend. Cal Poly did not score a single run against Texas in 27 innings. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I think if all of all of those losses, the biggest shocking one would be Campbell losing at home to Delaware. Easy. That I mean, yep. I'm sorry, but, like, you don't lose at home to Delaware. I don't care if Delaware has a Friday night guy that throws 99 miles an hour. I don't care. You cannot lose the series at home to Delaware. Georgia Southern, they're a good team. They're a, they're a middle of the pack, upper tier pack of the Sun Belt. Um, Coastal Carolina, App State had been playing well. Last year they had a good team. They made yep. a little run in the Sun Belt tournament. This year they're a good team. Are they top 25 worthy or mid-major? They're coming. They're coming. We're paying attention. It happened. Um, Santa Barbara, Cal Poly. I mean, Cal Poly is not a terrible team either. Are they great? No. But when you look at, when you think of Delaware, they have no business being on the same field as Campbell. I Here, I'm going to check you. And, and the only reason I will is because I saw them last year. The Sun Belt's almost like the SEC. Like, it's so difficult to go play on the road in the Sun Belt. So that's why. I think that this was a situation where Campbell is going to have to, like, go into weekend series a little bit more prepped. I played in the Big South. Campbell could go drink 35 beers on Thursday night, wake up on Friday morning, and beat the shit out of us in the Big South. And they probably did. Like, they probably did. I mean, yeah. 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 Awesome. yeah. Hey, yo, Delaware's got a four-hole third baseman. That was a first team. Like, like he was the third base fresh. I mean, he was a freshman All-American. Joey Lloyd is his name. He's a stud. He hits piss missiles. Um I just think that Campbell probably this weekend goes, oh, this is a different conference. Like this is a different level of baseball. So I think it's I think it's going to serve as an eye opener and go, all right, like, hey, we need to like strap it up a little bit. You know, let's let's prep maybe a little bit cleaner. I don't know what that looks like or what happened this weekend or maybe if they caught him off guard. But Delaware's a better baseball team than you think. They finished, I believe, fourth in the CAA tournament last year. They beat the College of Charleston at home on their field with Cole Mass at this first rounder on the mound. So, like, they're a better team than you might think. Um, I just think it's the CAA going, hey, welcome to it. I, I think they're a top seven conference in baseball, but, like, welcome to it a little bit. For sure. Um, all right, now we can jump into the ACC. Um, we already kind of talked about Wake Forest. We talked about NC State. NC State with a huge statement weekend, winning two out of three at home against Duke, um, including that seven-run comeback, which was unbelievable. Uh, North Carolina sweeps Georgia Tech. It's weird. Like the ACC has so much. Hey, one more. There's one more theory. Like, Bring up one more theory. You're forgetting one. Hold on. Let me finish my thought, dude. Nope. Mention Relax. the other theory. Relax. I'm getting there. I'm just saying there's so much parody with 
in Georgia Tech sweeps NC State last week. NC State, I mean, when Duke wins the series um, last week as well, but then Duke get, loses 203 at NC State. Georgia Tech gets swept by UNC. It's, it's like a parody league, just like the SEC and just like the rest of college baseball. Um, what series were you? Oh, you, we already talked about Clemson, Florida State. Is that the one? Oh, Miami. Miami. What happened in that Miami series, Dimitri? I'll let you have the floor. No, you tell me. I don't watch. Do you, you, I know you know the result of it. Just tell me what happened in that series. I refuse. Are you Miami's confused? still a fun team. They, dude, they're still a fun team. You can't argue that. They had to go to South Bend, Indiana and play against Notre Dame. That's not the environment Notre they Dame team that entered the weekend 0-6 in ACC play. That's not where Miami thrives, all right? Get those boys in some warm weather in a hostile environment, and they will win ball games. They tried with Florida. They couldn't do it then either. Okay, anyway, all right, joke's over, fun's over. I told you. This Miami team. I, yes, I told you after one weekend. But I knew it was coming. It, it's been happening for the last 10 years. Weekend. It's the same thing every year, Ben. It's the same thing every year. We – Play well at home. The moment we have to go on the road, we stink. And the moment the calendar turns to May and June, we stink. It is what it is. Until if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, they call you a psychopath expecting different results. So that's my point. Like, it's just the same thing over and over again. They almost got swept. They they were down like 8-1 to one today and made a huge 7-1, to one, made a huge comeback. They almost got swept. Like, this is an exciting, fun team to watch. That's all I'm saying. All right. All right. All right. I'm not, on look, to, I never uh, said they're going to win the national championship. Ohio Valley? What? Nothing. No, I'm, I never said that Miami is going to win the national championship. I've said for the last three weeks, Miami is a team that is fun. They're youthful, so they're going to get better as the season goes on. And you don't want to see them in your regional, especially if you're a place like Alex Box Stadium. You do want to see them in your regional. Huh? You do want to see them in your regional. As no, you team. don't. They're going yes, to thrive off gonna the beat environment. Them. They will beat them. Nope. They're going to thrive off that environment. Dude, this is a high-energy team. I don't know why you're arguing with me. I know this shit like the back of my hand. And I'm going to tell you that this is going to be different. This year's different. I hope so. All right. We've spent way too much time on Miami. Uh, hey, let me let me breeze through the, uh, the upper, the Commonwealth of the ACC. Um we did say it two weeks ago. Virginia Tech's eight and one in the ACC, and they got Pitt coming up. Virginia just swept Pitt, gritty Pitt, Gritsburg. They, I mean, it was fun. I think they were kind of frisky early. They're going to struggle in the ACC this year. Virginia is another team that, like, you're not going to know a ton about them. I get to see up, see them up close and personal this week, but um, they're going to go back to a super regional some some way somehow. Like, Every no doubt. They just thought they're a walking supers team at this point. So shout out to O'Connor what they've done. But Virginia Tech, if they go sweet Pittsburgh, you're gonna be like, yo, they're eleven and one, and they've given themselves a ton of comfort when they get into like kind of the nitty gritty, and they built up a ton of confidence. D Martini hits his thirteenth yak. The Blacksburg's getting weird. I, there's something weird happening up there. Hundred percent. Yeah, you called it two weeks ago. You were like, their ACC schedule is a little soft to start. They might be 10 and 2, 11 and 1 by the time they get into the meat of it. So, um, but every win matters in the ACC. I mean, we've already, we can look at the standings right now. It's a jumbled mess. Um, I mean, obviously, there's a few teams like Virginia Tech that separated themselves. Um, I have it pulled up right here. Let's see. You have Clemson, 5 and 1, Virginia Tech, 8 and 1, North Carolina, UNC, 7 and 2 after sweeping Georgia Tech. But then you get a lot of like five and fours, three and threes, four and fives. Carolina with back um, back sweeps, by the way, after losing yeah. the opening weekend at Miami. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you look at it like North Carolina, like they look like a super regional possible Omaha team. We saw them in person. Uh, I think they're another team that's going to get better as the year goes on. Virginia, like explosive offense. Like they could be possibly like nine and oh in ACC play if they had any sort of bullpen. Uh, for those games that they lost. They scored a bunch of runs in those games. Um, I, I'm still a believer in Georgia Tech. I'm still a believer in Duke. The, Georgia Tech's 3-3. Three and three. They sweep, get swept. Um, but they're going to play well at home, and they're going to score way more runs at home than on the road. Uh, Duke's the same way. Like, Duke, you look at them, 
physically like huge player. Like they're just big, a big, strong team with good arms. They they lose two out of three this weekend. They should have won two out of three. They blew eight run lead in the ninth. Um, so that record could be way different. And then like Florida State, Wake Forest, we already know about them. Super talented. NC State, big statement win this weekend. The ACC is going to be a lot of fun. I, I think this is going to be like a six or seven team race to see who wins it. I agree. Yeah. The um, the Big 12 is interesting too. We can talk about the Big 12 and how TCU is two and seven to start Big 12 play. <laughs> That's not good, boys. That's not good. And, and one of those wins was Peyton Tolley putting his nuts on the table, going complete game shutout. But, yeah. Are, are you just worried about TCU? Like, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think you're the winning. same thing as last year. I don't think you're winning the Big 12 starting 2-7. and seven. Uh, just me. That means they need, they need two sweeps this year just to make up for the rough start. Can it be done? Sure. But I just don't think so. I think – I think, I mean, let's see. Who who do they have left? They've got they have Houston, um, Cincinnati, Texas Tech, Texas, Kansas State. Baylor, all right. Let's just say West they go Virginia. two and one, three and oh, five and one, and then two and one against Texas Tech, five and one, seven and two. They're at nine and nine again. They're right at 500 heading into their final four Big 12 series. So they could be just fine. I just think, I just think, where should we get that confidence that they're going to do what they're supposed to do? Yeah, the Big 12 is still super strong. I, and there's yeah. – you look at the RPI. Like, you know who leads their RPI right now? Um, Their RPI at 39. I earlier. Is it, is it Kansas State or Oklahoma? It's Kansas State. Who's the oh, one? Oh, 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 uh, UCF at the highest RPI in the conference. Is it, It's not Kansas State? UCF has six. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. I keep forgetting they're in the damn Big And they're 12. four and five in conference, which is – like middle of the pack. Yeah. But that's, and I know we'll do the previews next week, but to me, Kansas State's a team that you're getting Tyson neighbors back. Who I think we've brought up almost every podcast, but we're just so excited about what he brings to that team that they've got Texas this weekend. Texas is another team like TCU that like, if they can get it rolling, like it feels like the pitching has been really good at times. And then the bats show up and then the pitching disappears similar to TCU. Like this last weekend, we're like, the arms look good, and then the bats disappeared. And um, if they can just put it together, but can Kansas State kind of stick it out until they get back to being really healthy uh, towards maybe the middle pack? But the, the whole conference as a whole is drunk as hell. I don't know a damn thing about Oklahoma. You called them early on, but they got not to the, obviously the best start. Well, they lost two out of three this weekend, which was shocking. They lost two out of three to West Virginia after winning Friday. Like West Virginia's hanging around, boys. Like four and two in the Big Twelve. They played a pretty tough schedule. Um, outside of outside of conference too, like they, I don't know. I'm looking at their schedule now. Yeah, they won two out of three against BYU. One two out of three against Oklahoma. They got Oklahoma State, Kansas, UCF coming up. Like, you know what's crazy? Win all three series. You know what's crazy? I love that we are and we have the ability to do this this year. UCF in the last three four years never won the American Athletic. It was always East Carolina. They go into the Big 12 year one through five games or one game under 500 with two series wins, and they blew a game against Oklahoma. So they could easily be five and four with two series wins their first three weekends again. I wouldn't say the worst team. Oklahoma State and Oklahoma are good. And Kansas, they're usually the bottom team. But it just shows you the difference between the upper tier mid major team and those Power Five conference is not that much. Now, if you want to talk about the upper tier of those Power Five, like the Oregon State, the Arkansas, and uh, stuff like that, but like UCF, East Carolina could easily go into the Big 12 and compete week in, week out, and compete for a conference championship. Love, it just shows you it's not that far. It is really not that far. You guys want to know something funny? Like, I'm extra proud of the Baylor Bears. And Big 12 fans and college baseball fans are going to laugh at my face. They're 3-6 and six in the Big 12, but – at one point, they had a three-game winning streak, two games against Texas Tech, and Friday night win at at Texas. Um, and then you look, they had a one-run loss, two one-run losses at Houston, both very winnable games, and a two-run loss at, at Texas Tech, a two-nothing game on a Friday. So it's like Baylor's hanging around; they only have a series win in the Big Twelve. And you look at their schedule; 
They have Cincinnati, BYU, and Kansas their next three weekends. Like Baylor three and six, like they're not going to be. I, I thought I thought they would win less than five or six Big Twelve games this year. I thought they were that bad, but they're finding ways to win games and even won a series. So I'm proud of the Baylor Bears. They're going to hang around. They're making this conference way more interesting. And because you look at it. The, the top 11 teams are separated by three games, like at the most. Like BYU is four and five, but only three games out of first place. Kansas, Houston, Texas Tech, UCF, Cincinnati, Oklahoma, West Virginia, Texas, Kansas State, and Oklahoma. Like that's your top 11 right there. And then you have Baylor and TCU below that. Yeah. Oh, cool. Kind of a cool conference. It is. Um, what do we, uh, we, we've got a little bit of more time here. Wrap it up soon. Um, yeah, I don't really want to spend anywhere? time on the. Uh, I don't want to spend time on the Big Ten or the Pac-12. Um, I, what belt. I want to do is what? Fun belt. Yeah, the fun belt I think grabs my attention more than those other two conferences, and it, it's just because of the competitiveness. Like Oregon, Oregon State, they're gonna one of those two teams is gonna win the the Pac-12. Like we all know it. The other, like the bottom tier teams, like we thought Cal was a real contender and they get swept by Utah. Like Utah's a sneaky team though. Like could make it back in the tournament this year for the first time in a while. Um, but yeah, the Pac-12 is like just kind of boring to me right now. Like it's just such a, I don't know. It's, it's a boring conference. The Big Ten, I think there was no sweeps first week in a Big Ten play. Half the teams are two and one, the other half's one and two. So just way too early to tell. But I'll say something. Know. I'll say I don't something. have much to say about those either. I'll say something about the Big Ten. Real quick, to the point, Friday night, Brody Breck, Iowa, getting beat by Purdue. Unacceptable. Just brutal. Like, they've been so underwhelming. I believe this podcast may have called that. I, now, we also oh. said Indiana was going to be a lot better than they've shown, but it, Iowa was so fraudulent, it's insane. Dude, I, so I thought of a theory about Iowa. This Iowa team has a very similar story to that 2019 Michigan team. Oh, you think? Because so that just... 2019 Michigan team that finished runner-up in the uh, – I mean, they came in second. They almost won the whole College World Series. They lost game three to, to Vanderbilt. But they came into the season – that Michigan team came in the season preseason ranked. They had two All-American pitchers in their starting rotation plus a good third starter. And they went immediately – just. It was a crapshoot the first part of the season. If I remember correctly, I don't have anything in front of me, so I'm just doing it off memory. It was the first year of 11.7. We were hanging on the guys, um, uh, Henry, Tommy Henry. Demetri, do you remember that 2019 Michigan team? How yeah. they came into the season, two All-American pitchers, preseason ranked um, out of the Big Ten, and immediately the first part of the season, they sucked. They were so bad. I think they ended up having to win the Big Ten tournament just to get into the regionals, and then they – were carried by Tommy Henry and uh, uh, Jordan Nwogu and and I can't think of the rest of the guys, but they ended up having like the players that were projected to be good ended up being good at the end of the year and almost won them College World Series. I just want to put this in people's head. I have been hating on Iowa since preseason, but the formula and like the story is very similar to that 2019 Michigan team. If Iowa gets in the postseason, you can clear the record books. Like you can clean. Every stat and everything from the preseason. I'm not saying they're going to go on a run, but I'm just saying they, they could be a dangerous team. They well, could. could I? I'm, that was a perfect story to make sure that all we've ever done is say, hey, Duke's the number one team in the country. They get beat. Uh, every We jinx everything. So I'm glad that I could just do the same for Iowa. They're one in five in quad <laughs> one wins uh, in quad one games this year. But they do. I just pulled up their uh, their schedule: Illinois State, Minnesota, Bradley, Michigan, St. Thomas, Ohio State. They gave up a ten spot on Friday night to Purdue. End up winning the series, so you're okay, cool. They, but I mean, but but they should be sweeping Purdue. That's I know right. that's my point. Well, you shouldn't be giving up a ten spot on Friday, no. dude. That throws a million. Um, but yeah, I well, I'm good. I'm glad that they're going to win the national championship, though. That's good news. Yeah, I just pulled up the uh, 2019 Michigan team. It was preseason ranked. Uh, they actually started out pretty good, but then they started losing. Like, got swept at Texas Tech. Um, he's, I'm, I'm checking their Big Ten play real fast. 
They lost two out of three to Ohio State first Big Ten weekend. And they swept Northwestern, but that Northwestern team was like historically bad. Um, well, actually, you know what? They swept, they swept, they swept. Lost two out of three. Lost two out of three. Anyways. Anyway, Michigan, 2019 Michigan was kind of better, a way better record than this Purdue. I mean, this Iowa team. We're turning that, into that was, a snooze fest of a podcast right now. No offense, yeah. Ben. What? Dang, dude. Why are you being so mean? I'm not being mean. I'm just being brutally honest. It's turning right. into a snooze fest. I like it. Anyway, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Have some energy here. Uh, Big 10 stinks. Pac-12 stinks. Fun belt doesn't stink. What do you guys think? Louisiana, 5-1 and one in the Sun Belt. The raging Fire, right seller. <laughs> raging. No, I, I mean, I think they're a good team. We saw, we saw them play. Biggest stage, Minute Maid Park. They looked fine. The record wasn't as good as what the team was playing. Um, but it was that walk-off homer. Was it Sunday or was it Saturday for Kyle DeBarge against uh, Tulane that kind of just rocketed them to a nine-game winning streak or ten-game winning streak since then? Nope. They're 11-2 and two since pitcher came off the mound and said, what the fuck are we doing at Minute Maid Park? At Minute Maid Park. They're 11-2 and two since that game. Wow. Yeah, I mean they're a good team. Coach Deggs always does a good job. Like, it, it'll be interesting. I don't. There, there's there's still so many sun. There's eight more Sun Belt weekend weekends left. I know they're five and one, but I think this is just going to be eight teams battling it. Like eight, seven, seven, eight teams in the Sun Belt could win it. It's going to be. Uh, it's I, think it's, I think I think it's going to be a four bid league this year. Yeah, I think it's I more think. than four. I'm thinking no, five. I think four. Louisiana is going to have work to do in about a month. In about, what is it, April 25th? In the next the month or so. Year, right? And this is, a big, this is a bigger conference than last year. Yeah, but yeah, but you got to remember. Okay, Southern Miss, Coastal Carolina, those are your two locks, right? Sure. We can just say to assume those two teams are going to be in the postseason, right? There's two more. It's going to be a fight between Louisiana, Troy, um, and a couple other teams. Yeah, I mean, I think Southern no, Miss, no, no, no. Indiana, Coastal Carolina, Troy, Georgia Southern can get hot. South Alabama looks good. So I mean, yeah, I mean, speaking of South Alabama, how the hell do you go? How do you the hell do you get swept at home by Georgia State and then go win two out of three on the road at Troy? How does that work? We all pick Troy Baseball? and we can pick them. Baseball. Yeah. Well, it's because we said it was going to happen. We all three picked Troy in the weekend pick. Them. It was guaranteed for South Alabama to win. They were saying congrats. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I think, I think the Sun Belt is going to self, uh, self destruct. It's going to be a great conference, super competitive. I just think it's going to be really hard for four teams to have the resume of getting at largest. It's going to be really hard. I, I think it's at least four. I, I'm, I think five teams will get in. Dude, I mean, I don't see. I don't. I mean, yeah, maybe. I mean, Southern Miss, Coastal, either or, South Alabama, Troy, and then your Louisiana or Georgia Southern. I mean, Texas State. Like, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be really hard to get more than four. We'll see. All right, let's let's preview the midweek and let's get out of here, since it's a snooze fest. Um, I know Tuesday was already like gonna be an awesome Tuesday. I looked. I, I looked ahead. I know Duke is playing Campbell. I don't know where. Let me pull it up real fast. Oh, okay. It's Campbell at Duke on Tuesday. Coastal Carolina at Clemson on Tuesday. Like, those two games are enough, but we got more. Um, well, there was another big one that I loved. Coastal uh, at Clemson. I almost loved Santa Barbara at UCLA, but Florida, and Florida State's the other big one in Jacksonville. I'm excited um, for that. You said Coastal you, Clemson, right? Yeah, Coastal Clemson. Do you think that Florida – tries extra hard Tuesday against Florida State? I don't think they try extra hard. I think they just try a, a normal effort level. A normal that should be good enough. effort level? I think Clemson or Florida State can go through a little rut. Uh, they figure out their bullpen woes. I think Florida wins Tuesday 100%. 100%. Think about it. Think about it. Everyone's like, oh, my God, Florida can't win on Tuesday. Florida State, they should rebound. Flip the script. Florida wins that game. 
Yeah. Well, them trying hard in the midweeks hasn't done them shit. So they're done. I, I don't know. I, they, um, they out. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple good games, not super Lotus as a whole, but um, hey, we'll find out if Lamar is legit or not. If go to Houston Tuesday night, 19 and four yeah. on the year, 3 and 0 Southland Conference play. Are they good or are they not good? Yeah. Um, another thing to remember this weekend because of Easter, I think every team is playing Thursday, Friday, Saturday. A lot. So yep. for the weekend series, pick them contestants. Make sure you get your picks in before Thursday. Um, we'll have them out probably Tuesday. This or no, we'll put them out tomorrow, Monday. We'll, we'll get them out on Monday and um, we'll do a pod either Tuesday or Wednesday. Wednesday. We can do Wednesday like normal. Wednesday. Wednesday? All right. We'll do it Wednesday night. Yep. I, I just want to say to the listeners, I'm sure there was a bunch of shit that we uh, didn't cover from this past weekend, but we got carried away with a bunch of other fun topics of discussion. Um, I can't think of everything if we covered it all, but that was a, that was fun for me. Yeah. Wait, was it fun? You said it was a snooze fest. It was turning into a snooze fest. Oh, okay. We were okay. so up here, and we were just straight nose diving. That's what yeah. the big what Big Ten baseball does too. Honestly, Bingo. there it is. Yeah, that's what happened. Uh, yeah. Before we leave, here's my two hypothetical investments this week. One of these top ten teams will lose. I know the East Carolina is not going to be in the top ten after last weekend. They play UNCW on Tuesday. That's a big rivalry game, and like UNCW and Randy Hood will go into East Carolina looking to like upset that team that they like don't really love. Uh, Another fun one that I'm starting to really gain some traction with. I know I'm an East Coast mid-major guy, but the CAA is a lot of fun. And North Carolina a and has been raking. They get a big-time conference point against the College of Charleston this weekend down in the low country. They go to Chapel Hill, and I want to see if the bats play. Um, that could be kind of a weird one, too. Take the over, take the runs. Someone's getting upset this week in North Carolina the week. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, that'll do it for today's show. We'll be back later this week. Um, appreciate everybody listening. Appreciate all of our followers. We got a ton of new followers this weekend on Twitter. Um, hopefully you guys are subscribed to the pod. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, check out our website. A lot of new fun things coming up here shortly. Um, now that everybody's bracket is busted, it is college baseball season. Uh, right in the thick of conference. So, We'll be around. Y'all reach out to us if you need us. But other than that, we are out. It is past midnight. It is my bedtime. So see everybody. Appreciate you listening. Bye.